my name A daughter has lost a father to the killing game A city burned down to ashes Memories lost in vain It's only gonna make us stronger as we heal the pain Oh, eat worms. Yeah, it is a misspelling. If I tell you it's a misspelling, what do you think it is? Um, hmm. just thinking. We got Brant in studio here as a uh, show for weird things. Eat worms. Eat worms. Uh, like how much of a misspelling? It's a very. It's a small one. Hmm. Justin, if I if I told you we have an email in the night attack inbox, subject line eat worms, and you knew that there was a minor misspelling, uh, what do you think? Um, eat oh worms. ear ear earworms ear maybe worms. Ear ear worms. Worms. that's right. Wow. So, I was oh. thinking cat worms, rat worms, oh <laughs> worms. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a weird thing. Yeah. It does. It does. So this is the night attack inbox. Oh. So, I know. Uh, hey, everybody. We're going to get started with weird things here in just a bit. Hey, Brant. Hi. I'm I'm the new host for Wired Things. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard great stuff about this show. Uh, Brian. Really? <laughs> <laughs> this show. This, uh-huh. one? this one? Right? Yeah. yeah. You know, Court Killers is later. That's like later. <laughs> yeah. Wired Magazine Tom is Merritt's different. not on the show. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Tom Merritt's not coming through that door. Scott's a different network, mm-hmm. I yeah. think. Um, uh, Brian is out uh, on assignment for Court Killers, so he's going to join us a little. Uh, he'll probably show, show up kind of in the middle of weird things. Uh, okay. Assume he doesn't hit too much traffic. No. Um, but I think we should get going to when... Is there anything you need to send me? I, I, I know I'll be a part of the show today. Uh, oh, Brandon, you? you're here just to get some files transferred, so. Yeah, I'm going to He's already got his backpack. <laughs> <laughs> I was just here to give Justin grief. In yeah, pre-show. give me that give business for, yeah. for standing Jesus is king. <laughs> are you why a don't you, Why don't you stay in Brian's chair until Brian shows up or something? Unless you got a, something else to do. I probably got work to do, but I don't know. What do you guys talk about on this show? Weird stuff? Oh, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. Just so normal weird. objects. Okay. Yeah, just about our day, diets, you know, you know whether yeah. I'm hydrating enough, like that kind of stuff. Just just yeah. real cool, cool guy talk. <laughs> don't um, even get me started on Elon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've also right, got in. You're already pre-qualified. <laughs> Uh, we've also got Open Bayou here in the studio. He doesn't have a mic, so we're not going to be able to hear him if he says anything. But 
Uh, everyone, keep him sure. Sure, thoughts. he's in the studio. I believe you. <laughs> so, what's our take on space elevators? Let's get into this. It's been a while since we've done space elevators. <laughs> well, you got to go back about nine years into. <laughs> okay. The, the the short answer is that before fully reusable rockets seemed to be an effective form of transportation. They seem like a neat idea, but actually now with full reusability, possibly something happened in the next year or so. The cost of a space elevator is higher than people realize, not just the building costs, but actually the energy costs. So, And think of all the buttons you would have to get. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you press the wrong one, it still has to go there anyways. It, oh, it's going to be Droopy Dog going up. <laughs> <laughs> Just another another boondoggle for big button to get their mitts in our taxpayer dollars. <laughs> I mean, go. Think about, here's the way I think about like space, which by itself, like hundred years now, manufacturing all those problems are solved like that. You still think about like like high speed rail is a cool idea, but like yeah. in the United States, like in, in California, trying to build high speed rail is so problematic because every interest group you have to appeal to the number of contractors you hire all of this stuff what should be a simple straightforward thing ends up costing hundreds of billions and probably a trillion dollar project scale that up to an elevator to space all yeah. right now mm -hmm. we're talking oh okay so, yeah. <laughs> the, the bureaucracy and everything else alone but but really mm -hmm. with re rapid reusable starship works and Blue Origin gets their full reusability working. It's just your your cost per pound is so low. So, mm. uh, all right. Well, we should get started with the show. Let's go. Uh, you feeling good, Andrew? Feeling adequate. Okay. Well, uh, then uh, I'm gonna hit the button to start the show in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Oh, hi. It's me. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. And we got uh, sitting in for Brian right now, Brant. Brand hi. News. I just sat down in this chair, and they haven't told me to leave yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Although, I, I really like this. is like one of those, like the first uh, uh, time now that you guys have the studio, and that's just like a place that you guys are working, that there's just a wild Brant can just appear and be on camera, and it's not like you're going to Brian's personal home and like sure. waiting through all the empty beer bottles to get to a, a mic or lit uh, area with a camera on it. It's more of, you kind of have to, it's at the point where you have to butterfly. You really got to do a full stroke, Justin. Mm -hmm. You can't wade really anymore. No, no. Out of well, hand. Now, now that it's apparently become an actual hovel. <laughs> yeah. Hovel. We've got like one <laughs> weird, big anachronistic mug and that's about it. Yeah. That <laughs> the mug. Okay. The, the mug showed up. When we started Tinker. doing the podcast like, out of here, I, I don't know where it came from. Oh, no, no, no. No, here's why. Because uh, the one thing that as there was a professionalization of the entire operation, Brian's by far least professional habit is that he constantly spills drinks. So he was gifted uh, by our friend uh, uh, Katie Dirks. Oh. That gigantic mug, so it would be almost impossible for him to ever <laughs> spill anything that has that kind of heft and weight. Interesting. Mm. Wow. Wow. So in far, theory. so good. I'll say that. Yeah. I so mean, like, I, I have faith that, that Brian can indeed re-break that barrier <laughs> and start <laughs> spilling the kind of volume that a mug like that would, would allow. But this mm. is also why you should show up to your show on time and people, your co-hosts, won't just spend the first 10 minutes of the show <laughs> talking wild. <laughs> You know, a uh, garbage event. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, so Brian will show up a little late today. He's uh, on assignment for cord killers. Yeah. Well, you know what did not show up late? You know what was on time and actually faster than on time? What's that? Oh. Google's new quantum computer. I don't know if you heard, but Google has declared quantum supremacy. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I saw the headlines around this, but I have not dug in enough because I was on the road in Nashville for Politicon uh, uh, on exactly how much uh, pushback there has been to this. So in there, IBM preemptively published a paper or a, a statement saying, hey, listen, they did not declare they did not actually have quantum supremacy. This is a it's a setup. It's a lie. It's not true. And so there's a little bit of a of a of a war in the quantum computing realm. And, and to, to simplify things, um, we've talked about quantum computers before. The idea is to take advantage of quantum properties and to use 
uh, basically, you know, what you call qubits, which is like particles in some sort of quantum state, which theoretically allow you to process information at a much faster rate than you could use, do with a conventional computer because you're taking advantage of different properties of physics. Instead of a, you know, like a transistor that has a one state with physics, atoms can have multiple states. They can have several different states at one time, and you could use this to theoretically calculate extremely complicated problems. You know, classical examples, the traveling salesman problem, which is like, what's the shortest path through a bunch of different cities, you know, to maximize your route, where every time you try to calculate this, it gets more complicated, et cetera. So the goal has been to try to prove that quantum computers are useful by coming up with a situation where a quantum computer could solve a problem faster, significantly faster than a classical computer. And Google says that they've done this, that they had a quantum computer that was able to solve a problem that they said if a regular computer tried to do this, I forget how long length of time, they'd like they'd say they'd take 10,000 like, uh, years. 10, you know, it would take, the most powerful supercomputer will take 10,000 years to finish this. Now, uh, so they're saying like, hey, look, we found we, it was a very unique prop mathematical problem for it to solve and not one that has an immediate practical application. But they're saying, hey, listen, this is an example of a problem, though, that was solved by a quantum computer. You couldn't do this with a conventional computer. Now, IBM said, nay, nay, nay. Um, you said that this could not be done with a conventional computer, but what you 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 define the problem so narrowly because basically Google said, oh, you know, a conventional computer couldn't do this. But I best guess IBM was saying that you were was saying that I that Google was trying to establish this by saying the computer would do it, but only using RAM, basically saying it could only there wouldn't be enough RAM capacity to do this. But IBM says, well, if you wrote to disk, basically, if you could use a disk drive to do part of it or handle part of it, then theoretically, a, a regular computer could solve this very shortly. And you did not have quantum supremacy. Oh, so this is like basically IBM is accusing Google of using such a strict definition as to show that this would uh, solve this problem so much faster. And if you were to realistically try to solve it with a regular supercomputer, that can be done fairly easily. Yeah, yeah. So IBM is saying, no, this is this is your, your definition of a modern computer is not really what we would consider a modern computer and you have not declared it. So I don't know. I, I'm not smart enough to really have an opinion either way. I think that what I can tell you is that in the last 10 years, we went from, you know, oh, quantum computers, there are too many problems or too many limitations as far as them ever to be able to do anything practical. You still have the problem with uh, slightly, you know, uh, stability as far as trying to avoid interference, you know, noise, all this sort of stuff. We've been resolving those problems one by one. And I think that IBM, I don't think is disputing that we will get to a point where we have quantum supremacy, that that's on the horizon. They're just saying Google didn't get there first. Mm -hmm. what, now, uh, this is this is a, for the Google computer, is this, would this be on like the class of a quantum computer or is the, or is the gain so much in using the qubits, the quantum bits, so immense that it's not even a huge supercomputer yet well it, it's if you look at the size of the computer for this imagine like a really something the size of a hot tub you know this big cylinder that's filled with you know super cooled gases where you keep your things and the actual parts of it do the the kind of the computational stuff are like small but you know that's mostly piping and stuff like that but mm. uh it's a it's a beast it's it's fascinating it looks kind of like a you know sort of nuclear warhead there but yeah um it, know, it, it definitely kind of looks like what is hanging in the center of the TARDIS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah, it has it's like it a has, chandelier. Like, yeah, this very odd kind of like uh, a chandelier esque, uh, you know, kind of kind of vibe to it. Now, will will normal people is is the jump from using bits to these quantum bits, the qubits, is that going to be is there going to be a consumer level horizon that that this crests like will this be will we suddenly have quantum powered phones uh i i mean maybe that's way down the horizon but once you have this power you can solve incredibly complicated problems and a given example of right now is 
anytime you want to use something like speech recognition or facial recognition on your phone, you're using a uh, using you know a little a machine learning model you're using a neural network that was used used a lot of computational resources to figure out this very small model the right things to look for, the patterns to look for. So if you started using quantum computers to create these models, you could create incredibly sophisticated, you know, in a very short amount of time, you could build very efficient models, things like that. And that's one of the things you would start to see would be that the the ML models that we're using on the neural networks we're using would be way more sophisticated, way more smart. Hmm. And it's actually a thing that could lead you to let's say, uh, better artificial intelligence, not because you'd be running it necessarily on a quantum computer, but to build the model that actually runs the thing, to design the software, to design you know, the neural network behind that. So that's going to be a big factor towards it. You know, When you want to do research right now, like if you want to do computational research, and I've done this where you'll go to you know, Amazon or you go to Google and you rent clusters of computers to go run for a few hours because it's you know, you can run 20 computer, you know, 20 cores at once to solve a problem with, you know, quantum computing. It's going to affect everything. But in the long run, yeah, I, I could see that I couldn't conceive of what it would be. But the idea that we might someday figure out how to put a, you know, a quantum processor in a phone. Sure. I mean, I, you know, it's like asking, you know, me in like 1930s to try to imagine the microprocessor of the 1970s. You know, it'd be like, I, I guess you could, you know, I couldn't see <laughs> how, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, wow. It'll affect. Yeah. Hmm. So I guess just it, to try to like parse some of the intent here, um, I'm I'm guessing, you know, quantum computing is in such an early nascent stage at this point. Um, is, is this particular story kind of Google like having a sort of poorly labeled chart where it's like, oh, yeah, that's accurate, but it's a little misleading maybe. And then IBM is stepping in to say, Hey, let's let's temper expectations a little bit and let's kind of see the full scope of what you're trying to say. And so it's sort of like, sort of like this marketing thing of, hey, we want to we want to show off how cool quantum computing is, and we want people to be excited about it. And IBM just sort of taking the the detached perspective. I think that's a very uh, kind approach towards it. I would say it's <laughs> almost a turf war kind of thing. I, yeah. I think that it's it, it's even more so that. Because IBM's got their own efforts. IBM's doing incredible things with with computing and, and a lot of the pioneering research in, in quantum computing. So, I think uh, you know, I think it's kind of some people at IBM working on this issue are like, no, that's not it, and you know, we don't want you putting this crown on your head. Sure. And and I think look, uh, with, with these kind of milestones, uh, history tends to remember the person who crosses the finish line first. And so if Google is coming out here saying we've achieved qu quantum supremacy, IBM wants to push back if they don't feel that that's an accurate statement. Like, mm -hmm. like that, that, because yeah. you got a lot of people that have spent a lot of time and effort working on it that I'm sure they want to be the ones to step out and say that we have achieved quantum supremacy. And and to, gotcha. to give you an idea of what the stakes are, it's so hard for us to sort of kind of comprehend where this leads to right now. But take a look at like every year when Amazon puts out or every quarter when Amazon puts out their 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 profit statements, you realize the biggest sector of profit for Amazon. We've talked about this here is their computing services, S3. They wait, they make tons of money on basically running a good chunk of the internet. That's really where Amazon makes its money. And that was a thing that now Google and Microsoft, IBM are now trying to get into with, you know, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google, with their services and IBM with the services they're now trying to offer to do the same thing or related sort of fields because people look at like, the future's going to be, you know, the cloud, but being able to handle more of it and doing it faster, et cetera. And so, you know, they're looking at like the business model of the future might be, you know, you have some cloud, quantum cloud centers, whatever, processing tremendous amounts of data for people. And that could be, a, it's going to be a trillion dollar marketplace. So, you know, there's that worry about anybody trying to stand out before or somebody else getting more attention or more funding or more researchers too, because there's a big fight over researchers to work on this, both between Google's quantum efforts, IBM's quantum efforts and everywhere else. So hmm. I know mm -hmm. it's trying to, you know, there's just that somewhere there's, you know, a spreadsheet where they're looking at like, if this works, you know, 20 years down the line, this is going to be a huge part of the economy because this is where computation moves to. So fun times. Well, yeah. I'll tell you where you can move to if you want to support us monetarily, <laughs> and that is patreon.com slash weird things. Nice. You know, That's right. you can go over there right now, 
just look at it. Gaze upon this portal wherein you can support us. Keep doing this show. Look, even when Brian's out there, he's got stuff that he needs to do. Look, we got we 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 just pulled a, a branch out of our hat. He's on the show now. We're having a good time. Uh, this is all because of your support. So thank you to everybody who has done it. If you have not and you enjoy this show, head on over right now, won't you? Patreon.com slash weird things. That's right. What a handsome portal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did a little improvement there. That's, that's good. I'm going to uh, send something to Bryce right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is it's one of these things where at first I'm like, I heard the headline. I'm like, no, nah, that can't be right. And then I'm like, eh, I'm going to ignore it. And then I'm like, idiot that's perfect for weird things because even though it's wrong it's still interesting and you know sort of jumping the gun on the story so uh i need i need two farmers out i'm all about the wrong but interesting like that yeah. can define a a significant portion of my career I'm, oh I'm like i did so see this pedantic. oh i saw this one yeah. earlier today okay i i will abstain on this one hey uh brant yeah justin yeah what's up man your farm is great. I love your farm. This is amazing. Well, you know, Brant and I, we've been working this land for uh, for, for nigh on uh, a dog's Got age. Got to till, uh, in, till the dirt. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Tilling the dirt <laughs> and uh, uh, living off the land. Yeah. Can you give me a tour? Can we, can we walk around the farm a little bit? Oh, sure. sure. You know, first we got this fence. Uh-huh. And then, uh, uh, there's, there's a barn? Don't yeah, the look barn. at this. Whoa. Oh, big old barn. Look at that. Well, right? uh, don't, don't leave the barn door open. That's a metaphor. And we got these fields. Hey, what, what's fields. that sound? Did something just crash? No. <laughs> what, that, no. Uh, don't worry about that. That's farm A lot noises. of times. Yeah, you, you got a lot of splintering wood around here. Mm. You know, it's uh, the cows. aging. You probably process. heard the cows. <laughs> probably a oh, cow. Oh, look, I see it right over there. It looks like. Are those solar panels like attached to some sort of structure? Well, what just crashed on your farm? I mean, you got to be environmentally conscious. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, farm. that's what you city folk don't understand. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, we live off the grid. We, yeah, you know, and so sometimes you're going to have solar panels crash in your front uh, lawn. I mean, uh, I'm sorry it's going to take you a little bit longer for your postmates, but but we do things <laughs> a little different out here. <laughs> Wait, wait, let's go inspect. Should we inspect this? This thing looks uh, like it. You know what, Fred? I think it's about time uh-huh. for our daily inspection of yeah, things that Yeah, we do that normally. Played. This is about the yonder time, I reckon. Yeah. Let's get closer. Do we have a do we have a photo of this? Tip, tap, tip, tap, tip. Those are, those are the footsteps. Tip, tap, tip, tap, tip, yeah. tap. Paint a picture. <laughs> ah! What kind of farm is this? Well, you, you know, know, I mean, we you do got some research on the side. Hey, the yeah. biggest thing that we grow is curiosity. <laughs> and for space the market and, is booming. Oh, uh, we are in peak. It's big brain season, friends. <laughs> and we're, yeah. we're we're the number one we're the number one exporter. Care to describe what you're looking at? So this is, you know, this is a very standard piece of equipment. Again, uh, you dilettantes out there in the big cities, uh, you know, don't uh, probably haven't seen one. But, you know, it looks like uh, some kind of satellite with a uh, uh, four solar panels. Uh, it's got uh, wrapped in, uh, uh, you know, whatever the insulation is that kind of looks like aluminum foil. Or, it looks yeah, a little mild. bit like a really small version of the lunar lander. Kind of on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, uh, again, th- these are not uncommon sights out here in, oh, the, yeah. in the tree. You know, life we, moves at its own pace. We take inspiration from all sorts of places. That involves a lunar lander here and again. You know, I mean, sure, I guess we aren't going to host a Super Bowl. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we like to do things our way out here. Yeah, and there's so also... Michigan- uh, uh, some sort of uh, red cable attaching the top of Stat it. Stat stuck in the tree. Yeah, the cable goes to the tree. So yeah. a Michigan family found this on their yard, and the initial report said a satellite crashed from space. It's not a satellite. I can understand why people <laughs> might think that. One, satellites don't generally have landing legs. Um, <laughs> this this was a it's a space selfie. It was hang. It was a uh, structure hung from a balloon. 
that Samsung apparently sent up to take a photo of itself. <laughs> and this is a P- Samsung PR stunt. Um, and apparently it came crashing down on a farm. And oh so, my God. wait, so, so the, that was there. So Samsung could take a picture of itself up in space. So the uh, space. So Bryce, the, do you want to read the fourth paragraph down? Yeah. So this is from The Verge. As PR stunts go, this one was over the top, even by Samsung standards. The space selfie program involved a photo of Cara Delevingne that was taken on a Galaxy S10 Plus and was supposedly quote the fir- the world's first selfie sent to space. Users could then upload their photos to a website for a chance to see them displayed on the screen of a Galaxy S10 5G on board the balloon. What the hell? So you would upload your own photo, and then it would spit back at you a picture of your photo up in space. On another phone in space. On a phone. And, and let's, let's just clarify. This is not actually space. This is upper oh. atmosphere. Not okay. space. But, oh, but look at still that cool. selfie, though. Still, still cool. Look at that selfie of Cara Delevingne. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, that's why I made you. I can never pronounce her name. I'm no excited idea. to have you take that bullet. <laughs> so this is, we're looking at an image. I guess if that's a real one, where basically they had the the phone was suspended in front of what you know the Earth. And again, you're really high up. You see dark. It looks beautiful. I mean, when you go mm-hmm. sending balloons up there, it is really cool. Not taking anything with them, but it's like it's still not space. But anyhow, um, it's a neat. You know, it's a very cool kind of concept. But, uh, you know, you get it, you actually see the phone suspended up there and you get to see take photos of it and see what it looks like, which is so awesome. Wait, how long ago was this? Um, I because like, we are we are uh, for, for audio listeners, we are watching the initial press conference uh, where this, this uh, pre- Clara Delavine is is uh, promo- very excited as they count down to see her space selfie. Uh, yeah, this just press release is dated the 24th. And then I think yeah. the satellite crashed today or yesterday. <laughs> uh, I'm going to assume that this was not supposed to crash as soon as it did. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, particularly. Uh, I mean, you know, these balloons eventually come down. And I don't know if it was it got separated from it or if the balloon burst or whatever. I don't know if they maybe followed through on that. Um, I don't know if this was the Galaxy Fold team that designed this project. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh Probably not the best uh, 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 results if the biggest publicity that you're getting is that the thing crashed in a farm as opposed to uh, anything else. I mean, also, like, I kind of wonder what hazard. Oh, my God. So uh, we're, we're, they, we're on the website for this. Yeah. The space selfie <laughs> website now just says, we're sorry. Mission control can't be accessed directly from your region. To find out more about other Samsung products, go to Samsung. That is so good. And it just says, we're sorry. <laughs> I, I kind of wonder with what velocity it came crashing to Earth. Hmm. Like, I, was it a hazard? Well, it was it, on a I balloon. It doesn't say here if the balloon was still attached. Because sometimes what happens, these things get up really high up, and then the balloons burst. Mm-hmm. And then these things fall. It doesn't. It yeah. doesn't look in that bad of shape, though. It doesn't like. It, it looks like it kind of muffed up the the leaves on the ground a little bit. But other than a few bent solar panels, I, I, I would say they they could probably clean this up. You know, give it a little bit of elbow grease and send it back up up there. Yeah, there's not a lot to it, Bryce. It's basically some solar panels. Right. It's just normal yeah. farm stuff. Yeah. Just farm stuff living yeah. off the land. <laughs> I know all you city folks are out here listening to your Paula Abduls, but over here on the farm, we like to take care of things in the simplest manner possible. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question uh, that that maybe you guys know a little bit more about. I feel like space debris is like a real problem. Maybe this is low enough that it is not like would not have contributed to that. But is is there not like somebody? holding people accountable for not contributing to space debris, which I feel like this could have been if it got high enough. Well, okay. So when you first this, so this was on a balloon. So this thing, the highest this thing got was like a hundred thousand feet at max. Right. So space begins when you want to get to what you're talking about space, you're really talking 300,000 feet or higher. Right. And Mm -hmm. also space means 
think about space when you talk about low Earth orbit. That means orbit, and so in order to get orbit, you've got to be going about like seventeen thousand miles an hour. If you if you're going less than that, you just go up and you come back down. You know, you could you could send a rocket higher than the International Space Station, but if it's not going fast enough, it'll just fall back to Earth. Like we've had sounding rockets that have gone like in crazy, like you know, thousand miles, like eight hundred miles up and come back down. So hmm. you would never have to worry about a balloon or anything like that being part of that problem. But there okay. is there is the problem of things that we do put into space into orbit because it's not just that they're up there; it is that velocity they're traveling around at incredible speeds. When we sent the space shuttle up, I think it was like on the first mission or the second mission, the space shuttle came back down and they looked at the windshield and there was a tiny little crack on the windshield. God. And that could have been a paint fleck or something from one of our rockets or from a Soviet era rocket. So after that, if you ever see photos of the space shuttle in space, it's actually backwards because they would let it they would let it fly around the Earth engines first. So any debris would hit there instead of the windshields. And since then, we've had more stuff. We've had satellites break up. We've had, you know, like there was a Chinese satellite that maybe accidentally broke up. Maybe it was a test to see for, you know, trying to create debris, et cetera. So that is a real problem. Every country sort of has to assume their own sort of responsibility over that. But, you know, there has been like China got criticized when one of their satellites broke up because it created sort of a problem. And that's one of the things there's a lot more talk about is how do you try to get rid of this debris? And it's one of the things that SpaceX is looking to saying, hey, if we have our Starship, our fully reusable rocket, you know, there are ways in which we could go up there and maybe try to, you know, use different NASA, you know, using different ways to try to clear this up. NASA has looked at, you know, special gels and materials and ways to try to do this, but it is a problem. I but love that you're such a like, resource of knowledge for this kind of stuff, Andrew. <laughs> just ask the right question, man. You just ask the right <laughs> question. Uh, but it's going to be, you know, going forward, you know, that's just one of the things that just poses greater and greater risks is that we track this stuff. Like you, you mm. have to sort of everything you put up there, you have to track and keep where it is. Even, you know, there's there's radar tracking or there's formulas that tell you, oh, yeah, here's a bolt that was lost during this this mission to repair the satellite or something like that. It gets crazy. Now, hmm. uh, on on the topic of the space selfie, apparently Samsung had a had a response calling this a planned descent, uh, but weather <laughs> conditions resulted in an early soft landing in a selected rural area, which I think uh, selected is kind of doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All, all I want to know is whether or not these Michigan farmers are getting a check, you know, from from Seoul, South Korea. Like, like, are they are they are they getting some money just to make sure that? Oh yeah, no, of course this was planned. Us, this rural uh, farming family in Michigan, uh, you know, in full concert with the Samsung Corporation, free satellite project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Earth, we call it Earth selfie. How about that? Yeah, smart. Exactly. The first selfie that was in space that's now on earth now on earth that's yeah. that. i feel like i feel like janet from like the good place i want to keep going not space yeah. not space <laughs> not a girl not space not space uh but these things are cool like like as silly as this is and you know you know their their planned descent on private property or ask you know whatever it's still cool i still think it's a cool publicity stunt i like the fact that samsung's doing kind of clever cool stuff uh you know I mean, really, the biggest the biggest thing about something like that is that it's possible to like we're in the realm cost wise of of like Samsung looking at, you know, a, a balance sheet and saying like, all right, well, we have to pay this much for the celebrity and this much for the launching. But we can do a cool thing like well, that, high that. schools have done this same project, though. But uh, well, yeah, no, I guess that's that, that, that's my point. It's not that yeah. it's not it, it is the the fact that it is not remarkable. That makes it cool. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It just it just can be another throwaway stunt. So yeah, cool. Uh, you know, again, like I I I, th I think we're gonna get more of these you know things over time. You know, people doing more crazy cool stuff. More and, space and stuff or more satellite up. crashes. <laughs> yes to all of that. Yes to all of that. And I think as we actually start launching things in space, that is that is the big concern. Is that you know, one of the things that they do now, like, so SpaceX is their project Starlink, right? Their goal is to put thousands of satellites in orbit, in low Earth orbit around the world to provide us with internet service that would actually be faster than fiber optic because, 
you're not traveling through you know as much cable you're going through air and uh They've already launched some test satellites. They say that you know by the end of next year, they think they'll be able to commercially offer some services. And with the Starship, they're saying they'll be able to put up 400 of these satellites up at a time. And you know the concern is like, man, like they just filed a request to be able to put up to 30,000 of these in Ooh. orbit. But mm. the way these are designed, they're in low Earth orbit. So over time, if you do nothing, if they malfunction or whatever, they'll come after back five or six. What's that? They'll come back down. Yeah, then they will end up. They, they'll enough. There will be enough orbital drag. There'll be enough drag that at some point they will actually de- their orbit will degrade and they will burn up in the atmosphere. So you're not going to be worried about these things being stuck up there forever. You know, you have some orbits where things could be orbiting there for millions of years, but here these things will eventually come back down to Earth. So in in very Elon Musk fashion, he uh, tweeted out over the weekend saying that this tweet had you know was coming from a Starlink satellite that that was the internet that he was using but but that i was kind of surprised by how around the corner they were uh, how aggressively they're looking to like put this out as like an offering for for consumers well the who their first customers are going to be will probably be more like military and some industrial because they're not going to have a tremendous amount of capacity but they've already done tests with the military and basically uh, communicating Starlink to like a, a, a transceiver that was on board like an aircraft. Yeah. And so that might be early on who some of their customers are is, you know, the military, you know, needs its communication. So, you know, the idea that that might be an early uh, market for them seems like a given. So. Uh, when, if you were to, you know, uh, take a guess as to when there would be a commercial offering uh, and and never is a is a possible answer. When would you think SpaceX might have a commercial offering of Starlink? So the thing to think about Starlink, which which kind of gets overlooked in a lot of the enthusiasm for it, is that you have this this big massive array of satellites in space providing you internet. But at any given time over a location, you're only going to have a handful of them providing communications, right? Which is not ideal for, let's say, if you're like, you know, you live in Oakland or Los Angeles, that's not actually their ideal target for there because there are too many people there who would want to use that small group of satellites initially. So people in much more rural areas would be the first customers, people who have, you know, who are already dependent upon satellite access or have limited access. Because if you've got, you know, a, if you've got 50 people per square mile, that's probably their ideal case. You look for places where you have that, and that's where they're going to initially sell the services. And so a lot of people are like, I, I want to replace my service. Like if you live in a dense city, may not be for you yet because they just can't provide that capacity. So mm-hmm. I think that we're going to see early on, uh, I could see two years out or so, I think some of the first rural customers, places that are underserved or re- don't have any kind of access or entirely dependent on satellite, that will be where you're going to go. Uh, you and know, that's we, smart we've because about, like, there's what's that? There, that's smart. There's pl- there's yeah. huge swaths of America that it is just too expensive to run glass fiber tubes out there, mm-hmm. uh, and so they're running on e- either satellite or dial up in some cases. That just the the scale of how much land you have to cover, how much environment you have to work around. Uh, does make that uh, difficult, yeah. and we're still a ways out from a, a proper full 5G rollout. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, and you'll see whenever Gwen Shotwell, who is you know president of SpaceX, when she talks about this, and even Elon, they'll talk about, hey, yeah, our, we're looking to provide it in underserved areas, rural, whatever, and a lot of times that gets lost on people. They're like, ah, I want to have it, and, you know, and, and it's like, well, that's, they're not saying that the person in the dense city is their first use case, but the fact that they've actually that SpaceX wants to try to put up thirty thousand satellites tells you that eventually is the long term plan is going to be everybody. So, you know, the biggest the biggest thing that's you know going to affect this is the sooner they get Starship working, you know, that's a big factor because I think like right now with a Falcon Nine they can launch something like. 70 of these satellites at a time, which is pretty huge. But with start with Starship, they say they'll be able to launch 400 of these satellites at a time. Wow. So, that's I mean, that's wild. amazing. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that like for an average consumer in a rural area, maybe two years out, three years out, might be my guess. Uh, we, we just had a, a 
space.com report from from a few days a few days ago uh saying that they might have a broadband service by 2020. Oh no, they're going to have that. That was going to be for the limited the limited case scenario, I see. but not okay. the consumer. Got yeah, you. that'll that'll be, you know, you're you're making that deal at the at the Pentagon, you know, uh for for whatever, you know, white label version of it that that or whatever. UPS logistics or something like that. Um but big, this is big money players, Bryce, you know, uh, just just hustlers, big money hustlers. But this is this is a growing area because you have other satellite constellations being played or started up. Like OneWeb has already put up satellites. They actually beat SpaceX with their satellites up there. Amazon has their project Kuiper, which is going to be their own attempt at building a massive, you know, network of these things. Because that's sort of people sort of seeing the future, and the future is that you know you blanket the Earth with enough of these low Earth orbit satellites, and you can cover internet everywhere and forget cell tower. Well. You'd still want cell towers for cell phones and stuff because these things still have to transmit to something the size of a pizza box. But for a lot of other, you know, home-based stuff, et cetera, kind of amazing. Uh, can we can we briefly touch on? Uh, I, I did see that Glenn Shotwell got a little uh, had had a little bit of a, a sassy answer to a question on why she believes that uh, Blue Origin has not progressed at quite the speed of uh, uh, SpaceX. <laughs> So Gwen Shotwell was speaking at uh, a, 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 a forum where the her speech was not made publicly available, but there were people that were writing down what she had said, and we've we've heard some quotes about there from there. And so, perhaps the idea that it wasn't going to be recorded or you know made available, she was a little bit more uh, uh, sassy. Yes, it, Gwen, Gwen, the, it, no matter what, I am always here for the pettiness. Well, like Gwen Shotwell is amazing. She is, you know, we talk a lot about Elon when it comes to what Elon has done, but Elon will tell you how amazing Gwen is and bringing her on board. SpaceX is one of the reasons SpaceX has been able to do such incredible stuff. She's got an engineering background. She's brilliant. She makes things happen, you know, and she's she's great to listen to speak. And, you know, she's very inspiring. So Gwen was talking about, you know, the competition between SpaceX and Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's space company and Blue Origin started like two years before SpaceX, and uh, Blue Origin has made some, you know, done some cool stuff. They had the New Shepard, which was the suborbital rocket. Again, not fast enough to go into orbit, but you know, went up into the quote space, came back down, and they've developed a new engine uh, that's going to be used by uh, next generation rockets, including their own, which is an incredible engine, amazing technology there. But they've never reached orbit. They've never built a craft that actually has reached orbit. And even though SpaceX started after Blue Origin, SpaceX has built one, the, the Falcon 1, which, which was able to reach to orbit in space. The Falcon 9, which made it to the International Space Station, is now a workhorse that is doing a tremendous amount of work in the launch industry. And, you know, we've watched what SpaceX has done. They've got the super heavy, you know, all this stuff. And Blue Origin hasn't done anything remotely like that yet. And Gwen Shotwell said, well, you know, Bezos puts a billion dollars a year into this company. They're just not under the same pressure. They're just not, you know, don't feel the same sort of need to make this company, you know, uh, survive, I guess. Yeah. So that was, that was really the money. The money quote there was that the, the reason why, if you want to see why SpaceX has progressed at a level that Blue Origin is not, it's that SpaceX doesn't have the same kind of budget and that uh, she seemed pretty dismissive of the idea that uh, they were working, that Blue Origin's working on like a 10 year plan that does not put a lot of focus on near term evolution in a way that SpaceX seems to prize. And I, I think that, I think that cumulatively blue origin has probably got a lot has a lot of amazing developments i think they're going to probably we're going to watch them close the gap you know or we're going to see them doing some incredible stuff i mean i don't know if they'll close the gap completely because i think spacex has so much practical experience there but blue origin is still you know like i said i i don't want to undersell some of the things they've done but when you compare it to like the actual making money doing things like yeah spacex is clearly ahead of there i i just love it because you know, we and and look, this the life cycle of this podcast is is really chronicled. Kind of uh, space access to space being something that we initially started talking about because it was like sci-fi futuristic, and now it is very very normal. And 
now we get these kind of hallmarks of like this sounds a lot more just like a CEO talking, uh, you know, the way that they would about their rivals offerings and saying, you know, we feel very confident in what we've done. All the best to them, but we believe that we have a superior product for the following reasons. That just sounds a lot more like a CEO and not so, who's, you know, there's a defined pie that they are going to get some market share of as opposed to the like, well, you know, we're all doing great. You know, we're all just uh, trying to put some rockets in space. Well, before, and, before as, Grant chimes in, Bryce, as somebody the who's been the here the entire the conversation long, back. one joke at a time. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody who's been here for the entire conversation, there is a big temptation to pick one team. Like, only one can be better than the other. Let me make it clear. I think each has its own benefits. Okja was fantastic. It was a great Netflix original. Snowpiercer, amazing. And and, and Parasite, also great. Yeah, I... I, I and, and absolutely i i haven't seen any of those but i <laughs> no, that's uh, very, very, i don't know if you i don't know what you guys said before i showed up late but we did uh, not but tell I'm, people you were going and watching a movie okay yeah <laughs> we, no i was late because the only showing of parasite that i could see had me showing up late i apologize <laughs> uh, no worries no problem, no problem. Uh, thank oh, you yeah, to Brent, we who was holding down the fort shot well uh off the you know at a uh, conference sort of you know through a little bit of shade at blue origins direction and um i'm 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 excited to see what Blue Origin comes up with, though. And I, I think that I think that her point, though, I agree, is that when the SpaceX engineers knew that, hey, if we don't get this thing working in six months, we're out of money. That's a lot of pressure. Where if you're like, yeah, every year we're going to get a billion dollars funded until we do this is a different sort of thing. But, you know, Microsoft for the longest time you know, had tons of engineers working on stuff that we never really saw. And Microsoft sort of seemed like it kind of fell behind innovation. But then every now and then Microsoft would show you something, you'd be amazed at what they were doing. And I think that I think that I think a lot of the work Blue Origin's doing uh, may surprise us. But there was a there was a really cool video of like their factory where they were showing like, you know, the the ovens and stuff and things moving around and the automation from this. And it just looks like something out of, you know, the year 3000. It was just incredible. And so um, I want them both to ah, succeed. Of course, we all want we all want the fruits of 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 these uh, companies uh, continuing to make space more accessible. At the same time, I like it when people mix it up. I like I I I was delighted by Glenn Shotwell deciding to, you know, answer any uh, Blue Origin question with scoreboard. Look look who's yeah. <laughs> who's doing it now. Uh, and it's, uh, that's really cool. And that, it's like, and it's he, better for the company. Little... It's better for them to be the yeah, ones that are making. On, of course, they're going to think the, they're going to win. Get yeah. the, get the get things going, right? Well, yeah. I mean, from her point of view, is like when her day to day is great. Uh, Elon was up late and walked into the office with a new idea. Now we've got to figure out how to pay for this. You know, or in she's being compared to Blue Origin, where you know Bezos, you know, drops by and says, "Ah, here's another billion dollar check, guys. You're doing great work. See you later." So, yeah, be cool. Did you see that footage? Was that available, Bryce? Or uh, no? Was this of the, sure of the test of the crew capsule thing? No, this is a Blue Origins uh, factory. They they show this. Uh, it's just kind of like in comparison to what we saw um, of when we were at SpaceX with uh, the the overhead cranes and stuff. And this oh, yeah. basically was like um, kind a giant of this, gantry system. Yeah, I'll show you the the Blue Origin because Blue Origin has this big, huge facility in um, or, uh, Cape Canaveral. Pardon me. Um, and that, like, you see this big, huge thing that's like, you know, it looks like it's like bigger than IKEA. And then what's going on inside of there? Um, let me see this. Sorry. Uh, it's just worth seeing that, like, there. I think with Blue Origin, part of what they're doing is. A lot of the stuff is behind the scenes kind of stuff, but anyhow, yeah. what we saw was uh, basically they had the uh, the 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 fuselages or the uh, the the parts that go over the sh shells that go over the upper part of the payload. They had one of these things that was on a robotic, like you know, one of those robot pallets they use in the Amazon warehouse. But imagine something carrying the size of an upper stage of a rocket, just sliding across the floor and back and forth and in and out. And it's holy like cow. holy cow, yeah, you're like. 
this is just insane. So um, it's cool. Uh, what do we got there? Uh, we're looking at some more Blue Origin stuff. But anyhow, it's going to be exciting to see where things go like this. And nonetheless, uh, if you can find it online, awesome. Uh, gentlemen, do you want to do picks? Yeah. Hey, Brian, do you have a pick? <laughs> Yeah, man, my pick is uh, oh oh it, it's uh, Boon Jong. Oh, no, how do you, how do you say his name? J- Bong Joon at, at Boon. Bong Joon Bong Joon Ho. Uh, yes, Bong Joon Ho. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the guy who did Snowpiercer and Okja as a new movie, Parasite. Uh, I was told specifically very. Uh, uh, look, there are people that I trust a lot, and then and when they tell me to go in blind, I go in blind. Uh, the last time I had an experience like this was when one Justin Robert Young said, here is your one and only warning as your friend to go in and see Sorry to Bother You Totally Blind. And, uh, yeah. and I did the same thing with Parasite, which normally I would not have, have shown up late uh, on the show, but... But it was just one of those things that that uh, it was as important to me to see it blind uh, as to um, uh, see it. And uh, uh, I, I liked it. I liked it. Uh, probably not a surprise that there's uh, there's some bitter in that sweet. Uh, if you saw Okja, if you saw Snowpiercer, then you have a taste for the type of movies this guy makes. Um, uh, it's a visual treat, to be sure. Also, all in Korean. And it's funny because... You know what? That's all I'm gonna say. It's all in Korean, and uh, it, it 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 it's it's a worthy watch. Highly uh, highly recommended. And having I I saw the trailers a lot because Alamo is one of the the chains that is handling the limited release, and so um, I I I know Tom was also telling us or Tom was saying like go in blind, go in blind, and having seen all those trailer that trailer still it going in and seeing Parasite even with that I still felt totally. Uh, I don't know, surprised by it. So if you uh, have seen the trailers and you think, oh, well, it's it's not spoiled or anything for you. Uh, it's great. I, I it's, it's a shame it's in such limited release um, because it's just like, where can I see it? Like, where? Um, well, and, but it's great. Man, it, unfortunately, even to talk, I guess we'll save the rest for Cord Killer spoiler in time because like every word I want to say about it in an effort to get people to watch it will only possibly take something away from the opportunity to go in blind. Yeah. Uh, consider Parasite. Consider, friends, Parasite for you and your family. Great for weight loss. <laughs> <laughs> Parasites. Um, man, I don't know. A, a, a pick, a pick. Uh, I got a pick. Go. I, I already know Justin's pick. Oh, well then Justin's Justin, pick is a is a little upstart of an airline that maybe has some something I going did. for it. All right. I'll, I'll, I, I sent I sent a, a moment for uh, Brian and I's friendship because he has obviously been a big proponent of Southwest. I have not really flown Southwest much, but as my status degraded from my uh, 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 just delightful highs of being a, a recognized passenger on United, I decided to start flying more out of Oakland, which is a, a closer airport to me. And the big uh, partner there is Southwest. So I've been flying Southwest a lot more. And I got to say, it's uh, uh, I, I, I get why it has built up uh, the kind of loyal following that it has, that there are people that just swear by Southwest. And I think that there's a lot of stuff that they are doing that you're just now seeing a lot of the other major carriers. Uh, the, the, the fact that, you know, with an opt-in, you can just uh, for free get text messaging on your phone is huge. Uh, the way that they've implemented live television, I think is really, really smart uh, because they're running it basically through your browser. Uh, but it means that everybody can watch and it's a lot more reliable than the uh, live television that, uh, other uh, carriers have where you just have like a little uh, television in the back of the uh, headrest. So Southwest, you know, it's an airline. You should probably fly if you like <laughs> flying from place to place. That's take it from me, <laughs> kid airline. <laughs> it is. It is nice. Like um, it, it, it's a shame that they don't like let their prices be shown in those search aggregators. Um, but it's that it's like you get two, you get free bags. There's not like tiered seating. Um, it's it, it, it's that, open that seating. Is, that is, 
that is its own thing. So the open seating is easily the biggest drawback for some people where you're like, you are not guaranteed that you're going to get uh, into a certain uh, a seat if you love a certain seat or you want to do it. Uh, but having flown with Brian, I, I know that uh, uh, his cheat code is just whenever you're getting on, you're beelining to the very back of the plane and you're getting <laughs> the good seat that you want in the very back of the plane. Unless, unless you know, um, uh, so, so the first thing I always do is ask not at the gate because the gate has other things to worry about, but the first flight attended, how full are we on this one? If their eyes bug out and they're like totally, completely, absolutely full, then it's like, uh, uh, okay, just as long as you get a window or an aisle or whatever your preferred flavor is, it really doesn't matter where in the plane you are. Um, and it, but but if they say, oh, ah, I mean, like uh, pretty much full, that's code for guess what is going to be at the back of the plane seats that people don't want to sit in the middle of. So then uh, you, you make a beeline to the back and then you get yourself a window seat and, and then you try to look as gross as possible and then nobody sits near you. And also it's like you're by the bathroom. It was just, you know, I, I, I was texting Brian. I'm like, your, your, your legacy as a Southwest passenger has been a cheat code to my recent travel. I, I very much. <laughs> I can't. I can't handle that anxiety. And that I think that 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 is a big drawback for for uh, a lot of people. That you just it it is adding an anxious moment to an already for some unbearably anxious experience of clearing security, getting to your gate on time, flying in general. Like the last thing you want is some scramble where you're like, oh my god, are me and my you know, significant other going to sit together or did we remember to check into our, our flight uh, of 24 hours ahead of time? Like th there is, there is a lot. If that is a no, if that's a deal breaker for you, then yeah, there, there's just nothing that is going to no amount of salve that will, that will calm that. I just don't have the temperament. I just, um, I don't have the constitution. All right. I'm just, I mean, what's huh? funny is as you're saying that, I'm just realizing how different I bet we are on planes. Like it is perfectly suited to extrovert Brian. Brian's like, what's going on, plane? It's me. How are you? Where are you out of? Oh, awesome. How many seats are open? Uh, hey, this is my wacky buddy Justin. I'm gonna buy him a drink later. I. I talk to like I mean I'm I get chatty with the the gate people. I've bought cookies and stuff for people at the gates and stuff, and I get that. I just I, I like my window. I just love my window seat. I just I yeah. just if I'm stuck in the middle, I'm like I don't know which way to lean, and I don't like the aisle. I like I'm just like I I got my preference, and so like if you tell me like oh you're not gonna get it, are you maybe you will? I don't know. I'm like oh I'm gonna drive. Yeah, <laughs> and like. When when it comes to the the pricing stuff, like the their no fees thing is like legitimate. Like you're not paying for a seat, you're not paying for more than two bags plus two carry ons. Um, it's because I think a, last year or maybe a, a, a year or so before I flew um, United or American or something, and it was like sticker shock when I was like, oh yeah, this cheaper flight suddenly like now you're paying <laughs> for your seat. There's no seats available. Oh, you have to pay because this is a basic economy seat and it doesn't even include a carry-on so you got to pay to upgrade oh, this. you're gonna like, wear your mask in case of a disaster mm. yeah <laughs> yeah I, mean, I i i genuinely believe that some of the decisions that uh major carriers have made in terms of like reducing what you get for your money and like even now united pushing that this basic economy thing which is like basically them walking more the line of like a spirit airline or a frontier is just bad. It's just bad for business. It makes for a bad experience. And ultimately it is just a trick. Like it, it's, it's to get you in there. And then, you know, they, they hit you with, with the, they the, the three. You. Hey, you don't want, you don't actually want this seat. You just want economy economy, not basic. Yeah. yeah. Which like, so, I, I hate that, that those even show up for me. Let me, let me throw out a, a kind of a, in the middle of our picks here though, a weird things comment or observation we talked about before is we talked about, you know, the growth of like electric aircraft and stuff and self, you know, like fully robotic and stuff. I mean, can we imagine a future 20 years from now where, you know, you have these things capable of doing short hauls or 200, 300 miles or whatever. And you just go down to the nearest parking garage and hop on board one. And 
I mean, I, I think there certainly is a a, a design for it. Uh, uh, you know, my uh, although I've certainly come around on Southwest, my my actual favorite airline these days is uh, uh, you know JSX, which was the former JetSuite X, where they are, you know, uh, they're effectively just a regional airline. Things that have existed forever, but they just fly out of a private terminal where you can avoid uh, you can avoid the you know, hassles of like TSA and stuff like that. And uh, uh, specifically for Oakland to Vegas, it's like cheap, it's like cheaper than uh, Southwest uh, uh, on that route. If you're going at non peak times, but if you're going to Vegas in the middle of the week, like it was, you know, d- down, downright affordable. Hmm. Uh, th- this reminds me a little bit of uh, my recommendation from a few weeks ago, Alchemy, where it talks about like, you know, you would think that a faster plane would be what you want, but if you know, if you could, as you figured out, if you could eliminate the TSA, uh, then you, what you want is a shorter travel experience. Exactly. Yeah, because it was like you know, I went to go visit our buddy Will Harris, and uh, it was like driving to Sacramento. <laughs> like I just took a, you know, an, an Uber down to this thing. I just walked effectively right on the plane. Hour and a half later, I'm there in Vegas. Like it was, it was remarkable. Yeah, I think. I think that's going to be a very interesting thing to see because I once I got my head away from thinking about using flying aircraft within the city to the idea of like, no, let's just go 150 miles away or 200 miles or this or that and ready whenever you need it. And it's like, ah, I don't know. Cool. Uh, I got to pick. I got to pick. Uh, you, you guys like you guys like that? Uh, that yeah, like, that you like Firefly. Do you guys like Firefly? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, I wish more people would talk about it online, but I I, I found it okay. Do you, do you guys like uh like the good Fallout games like Fallout One or Fallout New Vegas? Yeah. Hey, well, hold on. Now, now you have my interest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did did you like Kotor? You like you know, kind of uh, Knights of the Old Republic kind of fan? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, Kotor. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah. It's, are you? Hold on. What's what's happening? What's happening right uh, now? So Obsidian Entertainment, who made uh, a lot of those games, have a new game out called The Outer Worlds. No. And it is. Pretty much all of those things. It's oh, very cool. Oh, how did I not know about this? This sounds awesome. So it is a open. Uh, it's an RPG, a first-person RPG, kind of in the vein of those 3D Fallout games, uh, where you are a uh, you were a one of like ten thousand people on a seed ship, the second seed ship, uh, going out uh, to the far edge of the universe to start a new colony. And you are awakened. At, you're, it's only supposed to be a 10-year trip. You end up being awakened after like 70 years by uh, this, uh, uh, this crazy doctor who is on the run from the police. And uh, he, he saves just you. He's only able to save you. And so uh, you sort of team up with him to save all of the other colonists uh, who are stuck uh, on this ship that the um, corporate government of of this colony has deemed not worth uh, uh, reviving. And so it takes you to uh, these different planets in this little solar system. And uh, and it's so, so they're not doing like warp things. They, it's similar to Firefly. This is all just one uh, very planet populated system. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it's not like Fallout where you have one huge open world map. It's like a lot of smaller open maps um, and and you're kind of playing off these different corporations. So the idea of this colony is a bunch of corporations teamed up together to buy this plot of land in space. And so they own it and they uh, make the laws and they have uh, controlled the society in this part of the universe for 70 odd years. Uh, and so people are born being employees of these companies. And when they, when, when they get hurt, they, <laughs> they get docked their pay for damage to company property. It's, it's a very hyper corporate um, sort of society that that you're put in, or China today, yeah. <laughs> sure, <laughs> or or a, a, a new new Elon on Mars a hundred <laughs> years from now, and so you you're supposed to so this is a very early thing, but you're supposed to meet up with this uh, guide on on the first place that you land, uh, but you accidentally land on top of the person because he landed the beacon, but he didn't realize he was supposed to walk away from it. So you step out, and you just see these legs under you. <laughs> so you end up taking his ship and uh, getting a group of companions along the way who uh, help you uh, team up with the doctor to try to save. And this is all a single-player experience? Yes. 
It's freaking awesome. This it's sounds very great. Cool. Uh, and it's it's got a lot of choice options. You there's reputation between all of the different colony or the different uh, corporations. Uh, lots of quests. Uh, lots of shooting. The shooting's really good. Uh, I, I I think it's really nice, and if you have uh, uh, on a PC or an Xbox, it's on the Xbox Game Pass. So on PC, that's like five bucks a month. On Xbox, it's like ten bucks a month. Uh, but you can play this now as a part of it. It's 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 a very cool game. It's, I think it's worth. It's certainly worth like a five or ten dollar try. Um, one more time, The Outer Worlds is what it's called. So stoked! That sounds awesome. Yeah. Very Andrew? cool. I remember I saw a little write up on it. And I just looked at that logo alone, the Outer Worlds logo, the way the O is. And I'm like, that's beautiful. That's right. just, yeah. it, was, it looks like a like a rising sun with the horizon. Yeah. Well, and it it, yeah. it sort of harkens back to the golden age of science fiction with the with the typeface font. And it does. That's kind yeah. of the aesthetic where like Fallout kind of had that 40s aesthetic. This has a little bit of that sort of almost steampunky aesthetic, but it's it's more high, more futuristic tech sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's all like synthetic foods and um, like all sorts of different uh, uh, salves and creams and stuff. It's it's really neat. And the writing's very good. Cool. My pick is simple. Netflix Dolomite is my name. Hmm. Is that already on Netflix? Yeah. I, I almost yep. like I saw that it was still showing at some Alamo locations here. Uh, I was really bummed that that one didn't come to my local theater because the the reviews were so so good, and uh, it it seems like, and this is secondhand, thirdhand information. Now that you're hearing it from me, but but it's like, what if Eddie Murphy cared again and told interesting <laughs> stories? <laughs> is is that is that an accurate analysis? I, it 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 is. It's delightful. You've got the number of other people in this is fantastic. You've got uh, Wesley Snipes in uh, you know probably his first. Uh, cool role that's not like a direct-to-video sort of thing and and i mean it's just great eddie murphy's great in it the story it's the story of rudy ray moore and how he came to make the movie dolomite which uh this is a guy that that tried and tried and tried to make it in the entertainment business and you know is in his like mid to late 40s and finally came up with sort of this idea and it just grew into something bigger and better and he made himself into a film star and you know, had an impact on cinema and, and, you know, the story of how this guy, you know, it, it reminds you a bit of, uh, uh, gosh, what was the, uh, the, the Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy movie about Bow trying Pink. to make, yeah, Bowfinger. Yeah. A little bit of a, bit of a Bowfinger sort of vibe to it, but this time, you know, Eddie Murphy being the Bowfinger type, the, the guy making the movie, but, uh, based on a true story and again, just great performances all around. Like Wesley Snipes is just standout in it. So Dolomite is my name. So that's Very great. Cool. That's on Netflix. Yep. So there you go. Uh, it's been weird. Nice. All righty. You guys uh, want to take a quick break and we'll do after things? Yeah. I got I to gotta sure. say hello to a few people here. I'm going to say hello to Bryce. Hi, Justin. Thanks for chatting, yeah. Justin. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for hanging Thank out with us. Oh, yeah. Good Jesus in your life. <laughs> so I'm tired of you walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You know what? Just for you, I'll listen to the album one more time. You should. <laughs> should. And, and it'll th- probably be the last about, time, but... Think about, you know, where you're at. Like, where your soul's at, you know? Like, <laughs> sure. think just think about it like that. Think about if I want to be saved or not. <laughs> Well, yeah, look, you know, you or you cannot use this gospel if you don't want, I guess. I can just listen that, to Ultralight Beam again. Oh. What? That's, I mean, my favorite part about that one is that he's like, oh, no, like, I'm having a dream where I am God. Like, <laughs> right. there is this idea that there is kind of a rattling down. If you are to follow the trail of breadcrumbs of Kanye's philosophy, there's like, well, I am God. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, wait, now I'm worshiping God. But I guess I'm kind of worshiping myself. Look at what I did there. I'm Kanye West. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, see you guys. Right. Bye, Brian. Thank you Peace. so much for for staying sticking in, helping out with the show. How's it going, Justin? You have a good weekend? Yeah, I was in uh, Nashville for I saw. Politicon. Yeah, how was that? Uh, good. Good. Demo the game a little bit. Uh, met up with some um, other folks. Hung out with Heaton. We did a little meet up on um, Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, got to meet a bunch of people. That was cool. And then uh, 
yeah, then pretty much Sunday, I just kind of hung out with Heaton uh, some more and then wrote the newsletter, got on a plane and got the hell out. Yeah, uh, apparently Heaton just got back in the middle of weird things. So he's uh, back in the studio house. Uh, oh, oh, I didn't know that he was coming back to, to Austin. That's funny. Oh, mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's still here. <laughs> he's, but he's, he's like traveling a lot. So he's, he's like, I mean, he was gone probably the past week at least, uh, for whatever. Yeah. Whatever well, no, he was in LA for, for a while, um, uh, record stuff. So, and then now, uh, he may or may not have gone to a Halloween, uh, party with a celebrity that I just was about to blurt their name. And then, um, probably he should be able to tell that and not me. Like, who's the other? Who were we talking about? Uh, Andrew, Andrew Heaton. Heaton. I was, oh, I had, I had uh, dinner with him a couple days ago. Yeah. You okay. See, yeah. Justin, you could have just said it was Andrew. It's our friend Andrew Maine. It's well, I mean, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was fun. It was uh, uh, Politicon is a fascinating little uh, little thing that uh, you know I've been to now for I guess five, four years. Is it? This is the first time years? they've ever done it. Um, they've ever done it in, uh, in Nashville previously it had all been in LA. Hmm. Um, I, I have to say that I'm definitely not, I'm not there. Like their marquee events are basically just like debates between people that professionally are talking heads on television. Hmm. Uh, and that's certainly not, that's not my Thing, but all of your favorite political heroes and villains. Yeah, they make it sound. They make it sound like the Avengers. They make it sound like X Men. Oh no, it's there. Like it's basically performative cable television. Like all their big things are like it's now. Like uh, have you ever been like you know flipping between Fox News and MSNBC and thinking like, well, the real people I would like to yell at each other are are on these other two channels. Well, come on down to Politicon. You'll get to see them yell at each other. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's I mean, it was a, a cool uh, cool grouping of people, so it was fun. Uh, Andrew, last week I forwarded you, forwarded you a few emails, um, and we didn't get to Terry's email, but I think that would be a very good one for us to answer. Right. Let me pull this up here. Uh, I sent it to you Monday, the 21st. Uh, very cool. Well, I, I'm, it sounds like you had a good time. Uh, hanging out with Andrew is always fun. Andrew Heaton's always a good time, too. I almost got... Sh- I, 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 I trespassed. I broke and entered into uh, Strange's home on Friday. Um... Did you get the wrong Airbnb address or what? <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, I almost feel like uh, is maybe this a I night should. Night Attack story? Yeah, I should save it for Night Attack. Right. I can retell it. Night Attack. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so I, uh, I get to my hotel. By the time I get there, it's like, oh, it's like 10 02. That's the reason why I was at the hotel for so long because I had to order food. I had to, I called Bryce, I called a pizza place. And then on the phone, I I gave them my order, and then they had to then they brought it to me like it, it's 1998. Like I didn't order the food off my uh, off Postmates or whatever. I actually had to call, and they a driver brought it. Like a, you know, they have. Was it a chain? Was it a big like a Domino's Pizza Hut chain? Oh, it was like a, a like you know. Uncle Wingdings, you know, a pizza palace or whatever, whatever. Anyway, yeah. so I get the pizza, but it means I got to wait for it. So I'm just sitting there chilling at the bar. And then eventually at, you know, it's like about 11, 1130. I contact Heaton and he's like, oh, OK, well, me and my friends are hanging out. It'll probably be going for another couple hours, uh, but it's just a, a chill hang with like him and these musician friends of his. So I'm like, cool. Get uh, uh, some, you know, uh, look up Uber to see how far it's going to be. And it's like a 25 minute drive. So I'm like, Ooh. I'm like, ah, you know, do I want to? Uh, why the hell else am I out here in Nashville if I'm not going to go hang out? I go to hang out. Uh, unfortunately, the Uber GPS is not very good. And so we pull up to what looks to be a house that is totally dark. And I call Heaton and I'm like, man, I, I'm pretty sure I'm at this address and uh, this is totally dark. Like, doesn't look anything. He's like, oh, no, no, no. Just come on down to the driveway 
and uh, we're we're in the back, and so it's like, oh, I'm, into the backyard, no! I'm in, uh, I'm in like it's one of those uh, uh, driveways where there's like a little cul-de-sac thing in the front, and then like if you were to keep going straight, you would be going toward their garage. Mm-hmm. So we do. It's also raining. And then halfway through me trying to figure out where Heaton is, the phone call dies. But we pull up to the back, and I see lights on in, like, the back, like, the door that would be next to the garage. So I'm like, oh, I mean, I guess this is it. So I get out. It's raining. Uber leaves, right? Yeah. And I open the door. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, like, open the door, knock on the door. Uh, uh, thing. Nobody is there, in, in, at least in front of the door. And I look over and I see just these a pile of like children's shoes and backpacks. Like oh, no. this is definitely like a family of four wars home. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I'm like, okay. I hope. Uh, to God that somebody that Eaton's face will pop from beyond somewhere because like it doesn't look like there's music playing there's like nothing it just looks like a a rural Tennessee home that has like uh, left their door unlocked and, and there's out- some family cowering looking through blinds at this terrorist looking guy outside their house is he gone no he's here <laughs> So eventually I, I get in touch with Eaton and he's like, he's like, no, leave, leave. That's not the house. Leave the house immediately. <laughs> and so we, we have a very, he's like, I'm just going to go to the road and start yelling and you start yelling too. And we'll see whether or not we can hear each other. You could send a and pin, we, send it, him a pin. What are you doing? The GPS was screwed up. And ultimately the Uber went to the wrong address. That was mm. that. That was the the thing, but it did uh, 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 create a very romantic uh, notebook esque moment where Heaton and I uh, uh, ran into each other's arms uh, while the gentle rain fell. Uh, you know, a real a real Taylor Swift moment in uh, the city of Nashville. It was it was remarkable. That's very sweet. Oh my goodness. Uh, how is this a problem? Houses have numbers on them. Yes, and it's dark. There were no lights like on it, and th- as it turned out, the number for that house there was none on the house itself. There was one on a uh, mailbox that was unlit, and so that's why the Uber driver was unaware. And based on his GPS, he was where he was told to go. Not uh, as it turns out, it was two houses down. Okay, uh... and I survived. Get shot. I literally trespassed onto private property and didn't get shot. So that's nice. And no one was awake. Uh, did you need to go take a break, Justin? No, I'm good to go. Okay. Uh, you feel good about that email, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Am I am I only one that ordered the AirPod AirPod Pros? Or is that to, did they announce those today? Yeah, they're on sale today. I did not yet. Oh, I thought that was Tuesday, Wednesday. Delivering, um, delivering on uh, Wednesday. Oh, interesting. Yeah, probably not. I just got the 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 second generation normal ones, and I don't like the I don't like the noise canceling. I don't like noise canceling. Oh. Fair it enough. does look like they have a smaller stem, which is interesting. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know. All righty. Uh, anything right. else before we do after things? We all good? Nope, nope, we're good. We're good. Brian, you feeling it? All right, well, then I'll hit the button to do this in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey, it's me. What's up? Mr. Brian Brushwood. Uh Uh-oh. I think you... uh... Hello, hello, hello. (laughs) I'll I'll, I'll, I'll be not muted. How about that? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it was a silent protest. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody, that's me. Hey, gentlemen, we've got an email. This came in before. Uh, this is from Terry Robinson. Terry writes, I've started making episodes for a tabletop RPG informational versus live play podcast, and the episodes done before I joined were a little rough around the edges. 
Is there a point where you think it makes sense to either re-edit or remove entries to your back catalog that are of lower quality, or do you think that's not a good use of time versus spending more time improving current episodes? Thanks, Terry. Hmm. It's interesting um, because it's not, he says it's not a live play podcast, so it's not serialized. So it's not like people will necessarily go to the very first episode. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to be a move ahead kind of a philosophy guy. I, I think that there's always going to be things that bother us about our past. Uh, but ultimately, I think the, the, the only line I would say there is it, it depends on the project. If, if your project is supposed to be, these standalone things, then I would be more on the side of like, all right, yeah, go back and clean up some some old stuff. But otherwise, like you really have to justify it in my mind uh, because you can always look. The, the the beautiful future is you you can create what you want and take all those lessons and make everything that you have that much better going forward. Mm -hmm. This is also why I strongly advise people who are getting ready to start a thing. I, I tell people, although I didn't take this advice myself, but I tell people make 10 podcasts because, uh, and then release the 10th one, because that'll be the first time that you have really an idea of what it is you want to do and tell yourself the lie that eventually you'll use one of the previous nine as a banked episode. Spoiler alert. You're never going to do that because you're going to realize that they're all garbage. Uh, everything always starts off garbage. Um, for if, if nothing else, take a look at the first season of star Trek, the next generation. Uh, and so now having said that, how you have to, dare you, Brian, do you have to go. How okay. Tell me I'm wrong. You. Compare season two okay. and season what one. Point is a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, uh, but but my my uh, as far as being revisionist, only if you have a liability in the back catalog. I would say there's maybe three things that I've scrubbed from the back catalog of all of Scam School. One was like an IP thing. One was a word that seemed innocuous at the time, but later has increasingly come to me, be a slur. And I was like, well, I'm just not comfortable with that. But like out, outside of that, um, I, I, I don't see, I'm, I'm with Justin, like like always be forward focused on on that kind of thing. I, I would say, he, he, Terry mentions that it's a, an informational podcast, which also doesn't make it sound like it's news or timely stuff. In which case I would say either, so if it's like, hey, here's this, this is a month where we're trying to show you how to DM, say uh, t this game system, right? Like, either go and redo that information, right? Re ro go and re-record those if you're concerned about the quality of them. Or I think if, if you want to keep them there, keep them where they are in the feed, then I think that, that would be worthy. Because if depending on how you're treating these, if you're treating this whole series of, of episodes as like, this is evergreen content, we want people to be able to go to the back catalog, maybe, maybe consider it, but also consider just redoing it, right? Like, um, I, I think... Like with Scam Nation, tell me if this is that aligned, Brian, with like some of what we're doing with Scam Nation is covering a little bit of stuff that's older Scam, scam School content because back then it was longer, it was sloppier, it was lower Low fidelity. fidelity. Yep. Uh, and so we're kind of refreshing, we, we, we are opening ourselves up to refreshing older content. Um, especially because it's older and it's not as good. So yeah, consider and, doing that. Uh, so here, let's say, for example, each of your episodes is going to focus on a different aspect of DMing, like uh, character building. Uh, which are the best dice? Uh, you know, are, are dice actually haunted? So you do all those things. And then, uh, so let's say one of your first five episodes are kind of garbage. You're embarrassed of them. They're not where you want to be. It's still your best attempt at talking about, are these dice haunted? So until you come up with a better attempt, you really have no reason to scrub that out there. But also, I don't want to see somebody five steps into a marathon stop and say, no, 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 that third step was messed up. Let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. Like, yeah. like it should be so far in the rear view mirror that it's like, oh, you know what? It's finally been forever long. We could finally go back and do that one episode right. And that is, I, I think you're exactly right, Bryce. That is a big part of the playbook of what we're doing now with Scam Nation. It's a delight to be able to do, uh, because it's not only just the resolution and, and having a more current uh, uh, cast of characters and better storytelling, but also we've added new fundamental elements like, like the, the, the recap segments at the end, which now we're able to carve out and make those part of the Twitter videos that we're doing. So you will have infinite excuses to go back. This is the great secret of the internet. You get unlimited retries on everything. If you do poorly, 
one of two things happens. Either nobody cares, nobody watches, nobody listens, in which case it's as though you didn't do it, or uh, you, you mess up so spectacularly that in a weird way, you, then, then your new job is to just figure out how that becomes part of the story with the new attention that you've garnered to roll it into moving things forward. Yeah. I have an issue where uh, I have one of my self-published books, one of the ones I did years ago. I didn't give it as much attention as I should have with the proofreading, which was fine when very few people were reading them. But as more people have been reading my books and they go look at the back catalog, I've now like I've had twice in one week, I think I got an email like, hey, there are a lot of grammatical mistakes in here. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, I think I need to hire a proofreader because – there's enough tension on that long tail now where it kind of affects everything else. There's a point where it was like, it was pointless. I'd better off just moving forward and writing a new book. But now I go like, well, because that back catalog now is doing really well, probably worthwhile to go back there and say, now's the time to go back. Uh, along and that same it. topic. I think we've talked about this before, but uh, what 15, 20 years ago when I was first starting a tour, I knew I needed a pitch book. So, you know, in five days I put together a 32 page leaflet basically but like the drawings on it were so terrible and lo-fi this is before i had a sketch pad or or the ability to scan anything pre-cell phones or whatever like some of the some of the illustrations were literally done just with the mouse and it's like good enough uh, they'll 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 give me five bucks and i'll sign mm -hmm. it after a show and uh those become increasingly embarrassing as your quality of work in, uh, improves and uh, I and so you know, and look, part of part of production is working non-destructively, right? Like, um, like while I was doing Trending Lemon for a while, which is still on hiatus, but uh, I every project, every episode is its own project. All of the things are tracked out very specifically. If I needed to go in, if I wanted to go in and change stuff later, I know when I started, I was I'm making music for the show, so I wanted to be able to like. Oh, okay, if I end up making more music down the line, then I can put, I can go in and change that later very easily. So as long as what you're doing going forward is also easy to edit, right? As long as you're continuing to give yourself the opportunity to make changes or build off of what you've started, um, that's also a valuable thing to keep in mind as you're going and making and more of it. Let's, let's pose the hypothetical. This is often a way to figure out if something is a good idea or not, or at least something that I would do. Let's say you're 50 episodes in and you're like, wow, man, there's a lot of garbage in that first 10 to 20 episodes. So you can imagine two extremes. Let's say you give yourself unlimited license to go back and fix every mistake of your first 50 episodes. Uh, or, you say you can never affect any of that, but you can quadruple your output going forward. Either way, five years is going to pass. Which of these two futures do you want to live in? The one where five years from now, you finally fixed every problem with those first 50 episodes, but your entire back catalog is 50 episodes long, or the future yeah. where you're already celebrating episode 1000. And it depends on how much work it goes into, right? Um, uh, if, if these things take you a long time to script out and then maybe maybe it's different you know with the podcast we do they're they're live to tape uh so it's very easy for us to just go and keep making them rather than you know it, it, it's, it's it, we'll see where that balance is I, 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 I'm looking over out of the corner of my eye. I'm seeing Andrew made kind of almost showing something in his hands. And I think he doesn't realize he's I still... I feel like I know exactly what story you're going to... I feel like you're about to give us some show and tell. Of, uh, and, and also, he doesn't realize he muted himself earlier and didn't unmute himself. It's, <laughs> <laughs> still We're doesn't realize... Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> no, he it's very lot of noise going on here, so I had to mute myself. So um, I guess, you know, there you have it. I think it depends upon which point where you are at what you want to do. You know, um, early on, it's like Brian said, the, the idea of the marathon where you step the perfectionist marathon, where you keep stepping backwards to go redo your steps. You know, that's sounds like a Monty Python sketch. But that's a good point is you don't want to stop your forward progress because you're trying to perfect the thing right now. And often we don't know how, like, we're like, you know, a lot of what I felt like I did early on was not good, but it was better than nothing. And just move forward and then get to the point where you need to. That, that I, is one of I the. I think that, that also like th that is a. Uh, uh, the, the, the hardest part about creating something and specifically learning or building into territory that you have not tread before 
is the anxiety of am I doing this right? Am I going in the right direction? Like I can put in all the time and effort, but a lot of times it just takes experience. It, it takes, you know, a, a, a lot of reps to figure out like exactly what, like before you know exactly what you're trying to build, you've got to try to build a lot of different things. And I think it can be a comfort and you can make yourself think that you are a perfectionist and you are still putting in the work by saying, oh, I got to go. Now that I've learned these lessons, I got to go fix these old things that were out because I wouldn't have done them like that now. When I think that that could be a misplaced uh, or at least not as uh, constructive use of your time when you should be really kind of confronting the anxiety of creation and, and just figuring out like, no, look, I got to be scared. Like I got to be, I got to be building things. I have to, it takes more bravery to take a step that you know might be wrong than it is for you to perfect the way that you should have been walking in the past. And ultimately, like, that's where you got to focus. That is one of the real benefits to doing any kind of live performance. I would say the perfect version of that is table hopping magic uh, in the variety entertainment world, because it's expected that you will hit uh, seven to 23 tables in three hours of doing your job. During that time, you're going to do a six minute set and every single one, you're going to get a slightly different audience and you get to iterate, iterate, iterate the same three tricks. Uh, uh, slightly less fidelity is doing, uh, if you're uh, later um, touring college to college, it was the same hour and a half long show, but it's like each time it's like, okay, I'm going to let the, this is the one joke that I'm dialed in on that we're going to tweak, tweak, tweak. And then um, it gets harder when it comes to being on camera and doing weekly productions because uh, you only get one at bat per week. But, uh, but I would say that in general, because of the nature of live performance, you don't have the option of going back and fixing anything. And I think that that feels like a downside in the moment when you're having to deal with it. But now I, I genuinely feel like it's a real gift because you develop that sense of there's no going back and there's no decision of whether or not you should go back that's ever on the table. And as a result, like you can see it in even the speech cadence that I'm exhibiting right now, it is a different subroutine from the speech cadence that I allow myself to do on Modern Rogue or, or Scam Nation shoots because I know that there is an option on the table to back up, but I know now that there isn't. And so uh, if you could develop both skills, great, but, but uh, whatever you do, in general, don't worry about what's in the rear view mirror. Nobody cares. Any picks? Uh, I, I do have a I do have a pick. I got a retro pick. I my daughter is finally she has graduated from and I didn't think about this. A lot of people question the value of Twitch. They don't really understand. Like, why does anybody want to watch somebody else play a video game? Because if you are the one playing your video game, then you are the director of your experience and you are responsible if things go slowly and it gets boring and you have a bad time. Whereas, uh, and for my 15 year old Penny, she really enjoyed watching other people play through the Kingdom Hearts series. And so finally she has started because she's familiar and she feels safe and like, no matter what, I'm not gonna be a sucker playing these games uh, because I know enough to get forward. And, and she has dived in, is playing the whole back catalog one at a time. But there came a moment when she was waiting for one of them to download and there was just enough time that and it, as a dad, you don't get to sit your kid down very often and say, you must watch this and experience this or whatever. But there are these brief windows where there's a little bit of a nudge you could do. And over the weekend, I got to have one of those nudge experiences where I'm like, oh, it's going to take a while to download, huh? I'm like, why don't, you, uh, why don't you play Journey on the PS4? And she's like, what is it? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Just, yeah, just, just start. And, she, and so Journey, if you're unfamiliar, this goes back, uh, Justin might remember it from the Game On days back at Twit. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, it's a short game with no spoken words, but beautiful, iconic imagery uh, that all takes place in the desert. And you have an unnamed protagonist and a uh, implied objective of keep heading west. And you pick up companions along the way. And it is remarkable storytelling that I, I hope... I hope I was kind in my review back in the day because I know history has been kind to it and, and it holds up. 
here we are seven years later, and uh, it, it was a delightful two to three hour experience. And mm -hmm. if, if you have a game console that has it available to you, just dive in. Uh, it, it's delightful. And now it's on iOS. Now it's on PC in the Epic Game Store. Oh, that's great. Uh, it, there is a PS4 version. It was on PS3. So there's a lot of options to playing it. It's, it, re it really is a fun um, experience, especially if you're playing it online and you have, uh, you get to have this experience of another stranger is also in your game and you don't really, you kind of need you're to work just, together, but you're not passing in the night. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very cool experience. And uh, it looks really nice if you're able to play it on something that has a lot of graphical power. And, and they, uh, they create a couple of those visceral moments that uh, there, there's one sequence in particular. That I believe it's the only time they do that in the game where you're so in it and it's not about a skill based moment, but the camera backs away and just captures the moment from the side as the sun sets behind you. I don't know if Bryce knows which moment I'm talking about. Uh, it's 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 uh, one of those you're surfing down a thing moments or whatever mm. that it's just it creates one of those indelible images that is that is just so precious. I I really dug it. Yeah. You know Journey. the just a side jag on the whole the, the the watching people play games like who's gonna want to watch a bunch of actors record a thing on film? They already <laughs> did it. You know I, it's. You wonder where this leads to because you think about your, you know, you, you're getting, you know, variety and stuff will cover news about like, uh, you know, Ninja moves to this new platform or whatever. Sidebar, who the hell is Ninja? You know, and then, but where these things are going, you're thinking about like, man, like, what's this landscape going to be like in 10 years? You know, are we going to go to a, am I going to go to a movie theater and watch like this epic session of somebody playing Fortnite or something with a couple other big personalities from this because it's like jackass level entertaining or something or I don't I'm just trying to wrap my head around you know where this could, could end up because it's mm -hmm. becoming I never saw it coming and it's amazing to see this becoming so popular I, I, I think we talked about this at some point but I, I think once I realized it's just a virtualization of sitting on the couch with your friends and one of your friends has the controls. Once I understood that metaphor, that mm -hmm. like that is a universal experience. What if you could have that with your favoritest of friends and also thousands of them at a time and your best playingest of one way friends behind the controls? That's that's what Twitch is. Yeah. 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 Any other picks? Uh, yeah, my pick will be Politicon. Uh, first time that it took place in Nashville. Uh, so, uh, Tennessee, a red state, previously had been in L.A. Uh, you know, it was it was a, a, a very unique and interesting experience that uh, I've, uh, I, I've really enjoyed. Yeah. I was cool. there this weekend. Yeah. So, who knows where it's going to be next year. But uh, if you like people talking about politics, well, folks, that's the place to go. Hmm. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, so I've been doing uh, these Friday streams, playing through games on uh, on Twitch TV. Friday night, night bright. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Friday night. Friday night Bryce, which I I still contended is an is an illegal marketing campaign, but I'm, I'm just saying that's what everybody's calling it. You know, <laughs> well, the go. lawyers will sort that out. Yeah. So uh, yeah. on Friday we just finished. I actually think I picked this maybe last week or the week before. Uh, I the Somnium Files, the game where you're a dream cop. Um, <laughs> I think last the last time I talked about this, I was concerned. I was a little concerned um, because the person, the man, the man who writes uh, this game and has written uh, these other great games that I love, uh, normally has a tendency to do uh, these big metaphysical elements to these games. Uh, and at the point that I was at, there were not really any, and I was concerned that it was just going to be like a really standard like murder mystery sort of story but also like it must have been something really convoluted and complicated and um uh when we did that last stream on friday uh we got we got the metaphysical bullcrap that i love uh in there the thing that happens <laughs> it like when once they tell you what it is and what happened it, it like all rushes in you have that moment of like all the pieces fitting in and you start saying, oh my gosh, and then that means, and then what about this, and then this? Uh, it's a, it was a very cool moment, and um, and I, I really did enjoy playing the game, despite um, the puzzle, actually, the puzzles actually being really weird, because they're like logic, they're like dream logic, and so you're, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of like 
abstract or just nonsensical stuff being the solutions. Um, but, but overall, I really did enjoy it. And, and I came to really appreciate, um, I think, appreciate it in the end. Um, so uh, it's I, the Somnium Files. I played it on the Switch. I would recommend playing it uh, somewhere else. Uh, because it's just a, it's a little, it's a little graphically intense for the Switch, and so there's a lot of load time stuff. Um, uh, or you can watch it, uh, uh, watch the VODs, twitch.tv slash nightattack, or youtube.com slash neshcom is where I've got them posted. Uh, I played through all of it. So, there you go. Nice. My pick is Good Omens. I finally oh. watched it all the way through, and I thought it was delightful. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I, 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 I know Justin and I came down on different ultimate sides of this one. I was really curious whether or not you would be uh, on, on Team Good Omens or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it reached the end. I was sad. I enjoyed it. I thought it was uh, a delight. I mean, it took me, it's one of these things that took me a little bit to get into it first because the, the pacing, the storytelling was a little bit there, but you know, it reminded me of, there's been some wonderful Terry Pratchett miniseries on there. Hogfather, Going Postal, and uh, Color of Magic, I thought is, is still one of my favorites. Well, you know, if you can find those, those are absolutely wonderful, and it, it felt like very much in the vein of those. You know, a little bit to get into it, then once I got into it, I was sad when it was over. So. Nice. Uh, I, I loved all the Tenant and Michael Sheen scenes. Uh, you know, that was great. I thought that was awesome. And that's my review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will I will admit, man, who boy, I want to say episode four or whatever, when they start to try to scare you with the kid, I'm like, Ugh. all right. It yeah. goes, it, yeah, there are parts that just, for a six episode thing, feel long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the kid stuff, that was, the, the, the Antichrist storyline was the least, worked the least out of them. But, yes. Uh, um, other than that, I still, you know, I'd, I'd fun and enjoyed it. it. Was a, it was a fun thing. So, you know, I enjoyed it. I, I know that they're talking about they're they're whispering around maybe making a follow up season of this. Would you? Would the three of you? Would any of you be interested in? Good Omen season two. Well, it, it's a more complicated thing because if all the creators, all the writers, all the IP owners were on board, then you know, would I want the? I, I already would have hesitations. I mean, I had hesitations about there even being a second season of Stranger Things. I'm like, it was so perfect. Uh, are you just going to take something away? Spoiler alert: they took a little something away. Uh, and so already, I'd be on the fence about a second season of Good Omens. But also knowing that it's you know, kind of based off the notes of a uh, co-creator that's no longer participating. That, that makes it more challenging for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I would be there more for it. I think some of the, some of the stuff that was, I haven't read the, the original book, but I think that part of the elements of the show that were in my favorite kind of seemed like adaptation stretching. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'd be, I mean, look, I think they know the beating heart of the show. And if you want to tell another story that involves that beating heart, then yeah, I'm, I'm down for it. You know, I, I've been, we're three episodes in right now, season two of Castle Rock and I'm enjoying it. And I, I'm again, I don't know if you guys have watched Castle Rock. No, uh, but, a few but it does sound like, by all accounts, it's it's good, and it and it tickles that itch of what I love most of of the Dark Tower series. Yeah, I I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it, and and not saying that you're gonna walk away with like a Stranger Things season one, but yeah. damn for a self contained the, the idea of the self contained season that it starts and it ends, and you get your whole story, and they're not holding anything else back really enjoyed it really 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 enjoyed castle rock and so you know i i pushed i put that out there as like that's a great and now season two you know the idea is hey this is a world where these things happen but these are different characters some of the same locations but this is a different story you know um a fan a big fan so you know, as far as good omens like yeah i mean like, if you have a different story to tell whatever and Sure, I, 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 I enjoy, it was delightful. You know, I thought it, was, it went made me, you know, feel nostalgic for that kind of whimsical storytelling. So I went back and started watching, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, and then you know the, the BBC production of that, and I'm like, mm. man, like, is there a connection between Neil Gaiman and Douglas Adams? And I find out, sure enough, Neil Gaiman wrote a book about that, about having, you know, you know, talking to and being inspired by Douglas Adams early on. And I'm like, ah, oh, all oh, makes cool. sense now. 
Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that book existed. I I want to read that because you the, you, f- you feel a lot of similarities in kind of their writing style and their their style of humor. Yeah, I'll pull up the the title of that if we have a moment, which was uh, Neil Gaiman, um, because it was just that there was just that sort of there was a lot of, a lot of British writing too was just so a lot of people influencing other people or working with other stuff because like you know the you know the Douglas Adams. Doctor Who connection, etc. So, uh, yeah, the book is called Douglas. Uh, Don't panic, Douglas Adams: Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, by Neil Gaiman with contributors. Oh, very so, cool. awesome. Yep. Yeah, so, just a, a bit about that. So, anyhow, um, there you go. It's been after. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. After yeah. things. Done. Dang right. Awesome. Damn. You want to buy a truck? Too bad. You're listening to After Things. You can't buy <laughs> you know a truck. Who, you know who does want to buy a truck and will not stop? <laughs> Look, yeah, Bonnie is just constantly sending me Craigslist posts for ni- mid '90s like Ford Broncos. <laughs> like she wants, she wants one of those beaters that like we know it'll go 20 minutes and then need to get the, everything fixed. <laughs> but but like she yeah. just is so over the minivan <laughs> she can't handle it <laughs> i think yeah well i mean and you guys are kind of aging out of, of of the minivan's optimal usefulness right yeah, mini, like, minivan is going to be penny's car in five months wow wow oh. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, well, uh, we're going to go get ready for Court Killers coming up in a few hours here. Justin, doing any streams today? No, 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 no. But, uh, yeah, more stuff on the on the horizon. So Nice. Andrew, so. any more streams coming up? Um, Not immediately, but probably do something this week. I just found this really neat quote, by the way. Douglas Adams talks about, or Neil Gaiman talking to Douglas Adams 30 years ago. And he says, we're talking about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was something that resembled an iPad long before it appeared. And I said, when something like that happens, it's going to be the death of the book. Douglas said, no, books are sharks. He says, I must have looked baffled because he looked very pleased with himself. And he carried on to this metaphor. Books are sharks because sharks have been around for a long time. There were sharks before there were dinosaurs. And the reason sharks are still in the ocean is nothing better at being a shark than a shark. And he goes on to say how Adams inspired him to become a writer. Wow. Wow. That's cool. rad. I really want to yeah. read this book now. Don't yeah. panic. Okay. Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Alrighty. Well, uh, yeah, keep an eye out. Twitter.com slash Andrew Main for, uh, for possible streaming. Justin R. Young, Schwood, Brykus, Mac Attawag. Thank you again, Brant. Uh, yeah. We'll uh, see you guys later. Bye. Thanks.